Good morning, and welcome to Comics for Breakfast. I'm your host, Jason Mink, and today we're going to focus on the work of comics legend Wally Wood. Now, I've gone to the old guys who like old comics archive, and I've pulled three books from the back issue bins for us to talk about. Ah, but first, a bit of background. Born in Monaga, Minnesota on June 17, 1927, Wallace Allen Wood was destined to become an artist. At age six, Wood dreamt of finding a magic pencil that could draw anything, a dream the creator undoubtedly realized in his three decades in the comics medium. Originally hired at the Charles William Harvey studio as an assistant on Will Eisner's The Spirit, the young Wood was soon inking, lettering, and providing backgrounds for Fox Feature Syndicate's line of romance comics. The artist's first signed work is believed to be in My Confession No. 8 from October of 1949, and shortly after this, Wood and partner Harry Harrison were drafted to provide work for Avon and EC Comics, although the duo parted in the latter half of 1950. Wood seemed especially well-suited to illustrate EC's new trend science fiction titles, his bold figure work matched by a dense and immersive compositional style. Over the years, the style would earn Wood the title the Dean of Science Fiction Artists, but there was still much to do. Wood provided work for a variety of EC New Trend titles until the imposition of 1954's Comics Code put an end to the line, afterwards transitioning to other EC titles like Aces High, Valor, and most notably Mad Magazine. Wood had been an original contributor to the Mad Comic. When EC turned the book into a magazine-sized publication, Wood remained on board, producing biting satire alongside other comics greats, like Jack Davis, Bill Elder, and John Severin. Wood worked outside of the comics field as well, providing art for men's magazines, paperback books, and advertising. One especially notable contribution from Wood is his work for the Topps Trading Cards Company. He produced art for Ugly Stickers, Crazy Cards, and the notorious Mars Attack set. That magic pencil was getting a lot of work even over at upstart Marvel Comics. Between the end of 1964 and the spring of 65, Wood penciled and inked issues 5 through 8 of Marvel's Daredevil, with artist Bob Powell throwing in as assistant penciler. It was Wood who gave the blind crime fighter his distinctive all-red costume, as well as first illustrating the hero's radar sense as a series of circular waves. More important still, Wood wrote issue 10, although it wouldn't be without some considerable griping from Daredevil's daddy and Marvel editor Stan Lee. But don't take my word for it. We begin with Daredevil number 10. Now, I found this coverless cutie for 75 cents a few years back, but with a splash page like this, who needs a cover? Our story begins high above a federal prison on the East Coast. Under cover of night, an unmarked helicopter swoops down and drops a mysterious device that disables all of the prison's electronics. With the lights knocked out, a weird figure slips into the courtyard and walks directly to the cell of one monk Kiefer, who he's there to spring. The unusual duo escape, but that's just the beginning. In a moldy tenement across town, a television broadcast carrying the news is interrupted. Via the TV, a hooded figure revealed as the organizer recruits dishonored Navy deep-sea diver Frog LeBlanc into his criminal organization. He simply calls Bookie Henry Hawk on the phone, but 
The result is pretty much the same. By midnight, this unlikely group is gathered at the Chemco building, where they are briefed on their host's new plan. The men are provided strange costumes which emphasize their animalistic abilities, as well as feature a creepy PB camera to relay info to the organizer in real time. The Cat Man, the Ape Man, the Bird Man, and the Frog Man are then given their orders, each creating havoc in a different part of the city. The next day, these sensational crimes are front-page news, coming to the attention of lawyer Matt Murdock. However, before we can get to the action, we discover there's more to unpack. Murdock's partner, Foggy Nelson, has been offered the role of DA on the new Reform Party ticket. Murdock is naturally suspicious, but agrees to join Foggy at a yacht party thrown by Abner Jonas, the Reform Party candidate for mayor. It's a swing and do, and Foggy gets reacquainted with one-time crush Deborah, who is suddenly very interested in old Foghorn here. Thankfully, this is a superhero comic, and we're treated to some action in the form of Murdoch overhearing the organizer's directives. Our hero is able to block the Frogman's waterborne attack, saving candidate Jonas from being impaled on a metal spear. Murdoch changes into his colorful crime-fighting ego Daredevil, the man without fear, and pursues the Frogman, but is nearly blown up by a hand grenade for his troubles. At the same time, Frogman flees back to the organizer's hideout, where he receives new orders. Simultaneously, Birdman robs Jonas's campaign headquarters, but Daredevil is there to stop him. Well, try and stop him anyway. <laughs> Birdman drops the loot but gets away, leaving our hero increasingly frustrated. It's clear there's a connection between these animalistic crimes and the Reform Party campaign. But what? Using his snooper scope, Daredevil scans the city for information, and it's not long before he discovers a crisis at a local bank. Someone is locked in the vault and will suffocate unless it's quickly opened. Using his keen senses, Daredevil manages to spring the lock, but surprise! It's a trap set for him by the organizer's gang. The criminals subdue our hero with gas and then escape with the money, framing Daredevil for the crime. Later, at the posh penthouse of candidate Jonas, we discover his own party is falling apart. The Animan attack, abducting Foggy's new girlfriend. Daredevil swings in, but is unable to save her. However, he does manage to defeat Catman, who is dragged off for questioning. Before he can spill the beans, Ape Man appears and attempts to throw a hand grenade through the window. So much for being a team, I guess. Daredevil is on the scene and manages to deflect the toss, and the grenade explodes harmlessly in the air. The two punch for a bit, with Ape Man soon getting the upper paw. However, our hero manages to dust himself off and follow Ape Man back to the Chemco building, where he discovers Debra isn't the innocent she appeared to be. Daredevil braces himself for the battle to come, unsuspecting of the ominous winged shadow descending behind him. The issue ends with a little cliffhanger, but there's more. On the letters page, we're told that Wood is too busy to finish the story next issue, so it's up to Stan. Even worse, Wood has forgotten the resolution, leaving our intrepid editor to pick up the pieces. You know, it's a safe bet that Wood told Lee to get stuffed after all the BS and second-guessing, which is a shame. Wood does a great job here. Sure, his dialogue isn't quite as sharp as Lee's, and his... Daredevil is a little more stoic, but it's actually a great change of pace. Tired of Lee and the Marvel method, Wood left the company, quickly signing a deal with publisher Harry Shorten. Wood was brought on to edit the new Tower line of comics and given reign over their flagship book, Thunder Agents. A special team of agents land in a mountain lab, but they've arrived too late. The lab has already been ransacked by the enemy, but all is not lost. The professor might still be alive. Ah, damn it. Now he's dead. It's the work of the warlord, a criminal mastermind hell-bent on world domination, naturally. 
and while the warlord was successful in killing the professor, he left behind a few choice items of interest for the agents. The gear is sent to Thunder Base, where a team of crack scientists begins to study the professor's experimental devices. The first is an electron molecular intensifier belt, which changes the wearer's body to the consistency of steel. Then there is the cloak of polarizer material, which reflects light and makes the wearer completely invisible. Lastly, there's a cybernetic helmet designed to amplify the power of the human mind. It's heady stuff, but who is qualified to wear such remarkable equipment? Well, if the splash page is to believed, this guy. Paper pusher Len Brown is deemed to have the right stuff by HQ, and he's recruited to come on down and try out for the big leagues. He's called up by Level 7, the inner council of Thunder, who draft him for the team. Len gets into his underwear and dons the belt. After a short period, his body adjusts to its remarkable power, and soon our boy is lit up brighter than the Christmas tree at Rockefeller Center. And he can punch, too, making short work of this brick wall. Karumph, indeed. It's not long before the fun is over and they make Len put his pants back on. He's in as the Dynamo, first draft pick of the Thunder Agents. He gets word of the belt's limitations. He can never use it for more than five minutes at a time, or he's risking his life. Now clad in a special metallicized battle suit, all that's left are the preliminaries. We cut away to town, where an eerie fog has enveloped all. Traffic comes to a standstill, and it's because of the aforementioned warlord. Here he is now with his lieutenant, Iron Maiden, who leads a team of blacklight goggle-wearing mercenaries in a raid on a scientific warehouse. They get away with fissionable material, and it's not long before Len is told to get in the harness and go and kick her tin can. Agent Dynamo is dropped from a supersonic jet. Activating his belt, he blasts through the enemy's defenses like a blockbuster. He picks up an oversized magnet and uses it to lift the artificial fog, plaguing the city, drawing the ire of the Blacklight assassins. An entire squad falls upon our hero, but he knocks them aside like tenpins. However, five minutes goes by a lot faster when you're in action, and Dynamo quickly reaches his allotted five-minute limit. With things suddenly a little more even, the enemy presses their advantage, driving Dynamo back before blasting him through a nearby wall. Knocked out, our hero is abducted and taken back to the island stronghold of the Warlord. Len wakes bound to a dungeon wall. Even worse, his belt has been removed, leaving him powerless before the machinations of the Iron Maiden. Sadly for us, the story is continued next issue, but from the ubiquity of Len on Tower Comics covers, I'm guessing he managed to get out of this okay. In spite of the company's stable of talented creators like Steve Ditko, Gil Kane, and Reed Crandall, the Tower Comics themselves faced distribution problems and the line folded in 1969. But Wood hadn't put all of his eggs in one basket. The artist had opened his own studio in 1966 and produced Wit's End. Featuring work by Wood himself and a host of collaborators, Wit's End was a step beyond American serial entertainment at the time. Being magazine-sized, it did not bear the comics code and was free to explore more mature situations, publishing work by creators like Frank Frazada, Harvey Kurtzman, and Al Williamson, as well as the first appearance of Steve Ditko's Mr. A. And while Wit's End was loved by its handful of readers, it proved to be another financial misfire, only reaching issue four before the title was canceled. However, Wood wasn't done yet. 1969 saw the release of one of the first independent comics in the form of Heroes Incorporated No. 1, featuring Canon. 
This title was intended as an anthology series, with all stories produced by Wood and his stable of creators. The first tale features Cannon, a hard-nosed man's man and secret weapon of last resort for the U.S. government. In this action-packed 12-pager, it's written by Wally Wood with pencils from the legendary Steve Ditko. But enough of my balloon juice. Let's get to it. Without warning, a top-secret U.S. installation is breached by gun-toting enemy agents. Everyone in the base is killed, save assistant Gene Voss, your typical two-scoops blonde would become known for. And while the top brass scramble to find a solution, no less than the President of the United States himself solves the problem by calling in Cannon. A one-time CIA agent captured by enemy forces and turned into an assassin, Cannon is reacquired by his handlers, who attempt to undo the brainwashing. Sadly, the effects are permanent, and so instead, the CIA goes all the way and wipes Cannon's psyche completely, bringing back an emotionless killing machine. Our hero is dispatched to retrieve Voss. Scrambling out of an Air Force hovercraft carrier, Cannon and his fellow agents are soon in fighter jets high above the Caribbean. The enemy fires volley after volley of rockets into the sky, bringing Cannon's craft screaming into the sea. But all is according to plan, as Cannon ejects from the down craft and makes his way along the ocean floor in weighted boots to a cave opening in a breach in the enemy's defenses. Once inside, the one-man army dispatches agent after agent, a killing tide of unstoppable will sweeping through the underground base. One of the guards manages to set off an alarm, pushing up the timetable, and Cannon comes on, fighting his way to the upper floors. It's there he finds Jean Voss. Unfortunately for Voss, she's talked revealing precious state secrets, which means Cannon has orders to eliminate her on the spot. Instead of following orders, the allegedly emotionless Cannon instead opts to preserve Voss's life, giving her the rocket pack intended to get him off the island. However, she's not going to get off scot-free. If she misses the Skyhope the first time around, Cannon has placed a bomb on her rocket to blow her up. You call it misogyny? Cannon calls it foreplay. They make their way to the surface, and Ms. Voss is on her way, with Cannon staying behind to wipe out the entire island. Hey, that wasn't part of his orders. I'm beginning to think this guy is a bit of a rogue. The soldiers on the aircraft are surprised to find Voss at the end of the skyhook, and they order an immediate atomic attack. Better hustle, Cannon. Our hero carves his way through the enemy's defenses with an economy and single-mindedness that would have been jarring to the Marvel or DC reader, who had begun to question the punch-first-and-ask-questions approach. Making his way to the enemy airfield, Cannon steals one of their top-secret jobs and jets off the island, but is winged in the process. Between the loss of blood and the powerful jet's acceleration, the agent nearly passes out, but fights through his delirium long enough to drop a bomb on the island complex. The atomic strike is called off, our hero returns to base, and Ms. Vaz gets the brush off. But don't take it personally, miss. Business first is just Cannon's way. Next up is The Misfits, created by Wood and then-upcoming artist Ralph Rees. Our story begins with the startling discovery that a new planet has appeared in our solar system. After addressing a panicked citizenry, the president authorizes a rocket be sent up to investigate this strange phenomena, but it's blown up in transit. Ominously, a silvery craft soon streaks to Earth, landing in the western hemisphere. An enigmatic alien emerges from the ship, but attempts to communicate with it, result in havoc. We flash back a few days, catching up with a beautiful young woman apprehended with a bag full of stolen money. Only there is no evidence of how she did it, and the woman herself has no memory. Told she is going to be placed in the Misfits program, the woman passively goes along with it. Don't do it, lady. No one's ever been able to replace Danzig. 
It's there she meets Shag, and any monster-looking little monkey person who we quickly discover is more than his captors realize. Shag is able to establish a telepathic rapport with the young woman whose wild talent is telepathy. Wild talent. I like that. It's then the alarm sounds. Glom has broken loose. The young woman is able to use her wild talents to soothe the mute gray monstrosity and the trio of misfits a return to the safety of their holding cells. And what in Sam Hill is a Glom, you ask? Turns out Glom is a child mutated at an early age to withstand the heavy gravity of Jupiter. Your tax dollars at work, folks. This brings us up to the arrival of the white alien, whose creeping aura of influence grows by the moment. Fighter jets are dispatched to blow the alien craft to atoms, but before the ships can reach the extraterrestrial craft, their payloads detonate, blowing the pilots out of the sky. Meanwhile, in the base, all of the soldiers succumb to some weird, mind-numbing ray. Only Mistra, we learned her name one panel back, sorry, is immune, and she reaches around the base to free Shag and Glom. However, the alien's mental influence is too great, and the young woman is forced to face the menace alone. What follows is a battle of the wills, with the alien quickly gaining the upper hand. His powers divided, Glom and Shag are able to break free of the influence, tearing through wave after wave of robots in the process. However, time is running out. Shag improvises what a certain Canadian mutant would later claim to be his move, having Glom fastball special him over the alien defenses into Mistress side. The alien distracted, the little blue dude smashes the alien's head in with a metal rod, ending the threat with a resounding crunch. We discover the alien is from a malevolent race that travels through the galaxy exploiting planets for their resources. The misfits have routed this invasion, but... For how long? In our last torrid tale, we meet Dragonella, another comely wood blonde in crisis. This time, she's an orphan raised by dragons, which leads to a series of salacious jokes at the heroine's expense. Dragonella leaves the land of dragons to seek her destiny, encountering a fortune-telling witch along the way. This is a great sequence, very suggestive of Wood's work for Mad Clone Panic back in the day. Dragonella is to seek her prince, and wouldn't you know it, here's one now. Prince Hal, for halitosis, is being pursued by an unstoppable force. What is this unspeakable horror? A horde of randy gals out to make the prince their husband, that's what. Meanwhile, her errant father, the wizard Freeb, sends Dragonella a boyfriend in the form of a green proto-shrek, a middle-aged lust monster. Man, sometimes these comics are a little too on the nose. Dragonella takes the chance that this big green booger might be the prince she is destined to meet, and she gives him a kiss on his big blubbery lips. Sadly, it's not a love connection, but hey, at least the middle-aged lust monster got a little sugar. Just then, Prince Hal shows up and attacks her dragon companion, St. George, before sweeping Dragonella up in his arms. However, George isn't about to be upstaged by this two-bit Lothario and promptly kicks the prince's ass. Just then, Wizard Phoebe sends an army of barbarians, Huns, and sub-goths to attack. What is it with this guy? The horde is fought off by our three mains, but the greater danger remains in the tide of estrogen sweeping its way towards our errant trio. Prince Hal is left to his fate, and Dragonella ponders if St. George is really her prince after all. I'm guessing all the puking is a pretty strong indicator, but hey, love is strange. Unfortunately for readers, there would only be one more issue of Heroes Incorporated, and it wouldn't appear for seven more years. Canon turned into a serial for Overseas Weekly in 1971, but the other characters more or less drifted off into limbo. We would continue to see Wood work as a professional up until the age of 54, when he died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Much has been made of Wood's bitterness at the end of his life, towards the industry that he gave so much to, but we choose to remember the man as a true innovator and one of the pioneers in this crazy world that we call old comics. 
Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this particular episode, please like, share, and subscribe. If it really tickled your tingly bits, maybe head on over to the old guys who like old swag shop and buy a mug, a t-shirt, or one of the other fine items that you can only find there. I'm Jason Mink, and I hope to see you next week at breakfast. Thank you.